Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Carl Pauls. I'm here with Gabe Ignetti, and this is the Eco Modernist Channel Live. Today, our special guest is John Clarkson. John is a sustainable development scientist and filmmaker based in Great Britain who has worked for 10 years in the film industry and 20 in renewable energy. He has a science master's degree from De Montfort University. He's working on a film scheduled for release this year called Stargazer, where we consider how to use two key pieces of technology to more easily harvest materials from space using space-based solar power and asteroid mining. The film includes interviews with key scientists from Japan and the U.S. Navy. Welcome to the program, John. Thank you very much. Um, it's great to speak with you. I, I've got, oh, I've got some questions here, but uh, just let me say space-based solar is one of those technologies that is, without a doubt, the future. It's all over science fiction, you know, the the Dyson Sphere, Dyson Swarm. Indeed. Yeah, bouncing ultimate, energy yeah. all over the solar system. It, it is in our future, undoubtedly. So can you tell us more about the film Stargazer? So Stargazer started about well, quite a long time ago. We were working on it before COVID. COVID got in our way a little bit in 2020. It came about actually because I'd worked in the renewable energy industry for many years, in fact, mostly with solar panels. And I got to thinking about the way that we harvest energy on planet Earth. And I started to read up about other methods. And I thought I came across um, Paul Glazer's idea in the 1970s. I think it was 1972, roughly, um, when he patented this space-based solar power. So I started reading all the books you could possibly... I've forgotten most of the names of the people now, but um, several key books on the subject. So the, the film really was born out of that idea that we need to look to the future in a, in a totally new way to consider how we can harvest energy in a different way not be trapped by the fact that we live on planet Earth and we have night and day and we have cloud cover and all the other things that go with it, which obviously, you know, limit the amount of energy that we can absorb. And ultimately, I also started to think about how could we use solar energy in a way that we could get into space and and harvest the resources that lie in space in a more efficient way rather than having to use chemical propellants, which... If you run the calculations, you quickly find out are virtually economically impossible to harvest using that method. Uh, it'll simply it would simply not work. And, you know, back of a menu calculation and you're there immediately faced with this problem. And, and the more I looked around, I thought to myself, yeah, OK, we could use nuclear um, as an option there. That is so dangerous. I'm thinking of nuclear proliferation. I'm thinking of all the things that go wrong with yeah. Um, you know, the nuclear world. And I'm thinking, mm, that's not really where we want to be. And, you know, having my kind of sustainable development head on, I'm thinking to myself, OK, maybe we could combine these two ideas, space based solar power, which people want to beam energy um, from space to Earth, which is all about what our film's about. And of course, using that same technology to perhaps propel craft using um, what they call um, laser sails or solar sails, according to how you deal with it, um, out into the cosmos, in other words, into the asteroid belt, and where obviously all this, you know, juicy material lies, where we can harvest platinum and gold and you, you name it, it's all out there to be gathered. And then I started talking to several other scientists. So I spoke to Michael Loweth, who's at Oxford Space Systems. And, and I spoke to uh, Nayaki Shinohara, which we did an interview with. He's a Japanese expert on microwave beam technology, which is the, one of the methods that could be used to actually beam very safely um, that energy to Earth. There are some slight drawbacks on that one, but the, it is possible to do it. People obviously, the moment they hear microwave, they're like, ah, scared. But it's actually really harmless because of the way that it spreads out. And then we started thinking to ourselves, well, what about the U.S. Navy? What do they know? So we had a little secret interview with a guy called Paul Jaffe. And he's a very interesting character, um, actually, in California. So that was that was a very interesting interview. 
I did try to get an interview with Professor Lubin, who's the guy behind what they call direct energy beaming, which is the technology that would be used using lasers to propel these solar sails around. He's got an idea that would, in theory, accelerate you know anything you like to a very high speed. So that guy, I didn't manage to get to him simply because it was COVID. Everything seemed to go wrong at that moment. So we, we took some of his research and we used that in our voiceovers. So that was fine. And it tells the story in a, in a cleaner way. And then finally, we spoke to Mitch Hunter Scullion, who is the man behind the Asteroid Mining Corporation. And he's a, a very interesting character. We did a long interview with him. We had to cut that down a bit. He's a, he, he talks um, you know readily and openly on the subject. He's Scottish. It's very interesting. So that's where our film is, really. And it's all about the all about how we can use this technology, not only to provide energy for the Earth, but also to go into space and harvest those resources that are out there. Wonderful. That's that's a very ambitious project and certainly not out of the realm of possibility. I know from the research going on around where I am that that space-based solar is very exciting. But that big problem is sending the energy to Earth, and yes. maybe the alternative would be to keep it in space. And so I see, yes, like, indeed. the yes, the usefulness of of that. It, it are either of these things, you know, either space energy development and consumption only, or even Earthbound consumption. Are either of those achievable with today's technology? Um, well, according to who you talk to, and again, it, it's uh, it's interesting. Naoki Shinohara certainly thinks in the next thirty years this is doable, very very doable, mm -hmm. and that's not a bad time frame. I think thirty years is nothing really in the scale of things. So you know, he's he's talking about China perhaps having this by sometime in the next ten years, and they are racing ahead of everyone, and he's quite afraid of that, which uh, for various reasons, obviously to do with, mainly to do with politics, I guess is a slight um, worrying aspect. But then again, you know, ev everything has its ups and downs, everything has its drawbacks, everything has its pros and cons. So yes, it is very, very doable. Um, we we think that um, overall, both of those technologies are doable. The ESA, that's the European Space Agency, did a very interesting um, talk um, about, about one and a half years ago, which I sat in on, and they told me about how they could use um, space-based solar to actually propel satellites up and down to move them to higher orbits. Obviously, you want to get into geo-orbit and you don't want to use chemicals. So you could simply, you know, fire a laser at it from, a, from something orbiting that's collecting solar energy and move it up to a higher orbit. That's very cheap. So those kinds of things are possible. That's not a subject we touched on very much because... We thought we wanted to talk about the big, the bigger and broader subjects. There are lots of applications, you know. There's so many out there. We would be bogged down in those, sadly. So some of those stuff, some of that stuff, had to, you know, sort of be left by the way. But yes, very doable. Personally, I think it's doable in the next fifteen to twenty years. But according to who you speak to, maybe thirty years. Yeah, it's always someplace in the future. But it's it's very exciting, and and certainly like just developing that industry. That could take yeah. 30 years itself. What are yes. the obstacles you see to actually oh, bootstrapping wow. industry? There are lots of obstacles. The, I think the biggest obstacle, if you're talking about the energy coming from, say, a space-based solar power system orbiting Earth, say, in a geostationary orbit, trying to beam that down to Earth, it's difficult because if you choose the wrong wavelength, you start to interfere with technology that we already have. So right. they have to modify some of the laws um, in some way and just move some of those things that are around the the magic number, which I believe is one gigahertz, if I can remember rightly, just slightly away from that spectrum so that we get into the right area. Because if we don't, it won't work. But but yeah, I mean, you could place it out though, remote areas. Easter Island, for example, is one that we talk about a lot. Uh, we went out to Easter Island on another mission, actually, on another film we were making about Easter Island. And we spoke to the British, well, the honorary British consul. They don't actually have one, uh, an official one, but they, have an, they had an honorary one there. And we spoke to him about that technology because Easter Island is a very unusual place. Firstly, it's very remote. You're probably further away from civilization there than you are if you're on the moon, if you kind of get my drift, you know, in many ways, if you, if you work it out. 
they have a problem with diesel fuel. They get it all shipped in from Chile. Easter Island is the famous, if you remember, the where the statues, the Moai statues are the huge. You know, and everyone has a myth, mythological story about those, don't they, that they make up. But anyway, so there's a problem in energy on that island. And one solution would be to put a large underwater rectenna, which is the receiving technology for a space-based solar power system out at sea and then literally beam that energy to it and then send that to the islands and then you could link up using cables to all the polynesian islands and because it's so far away from everywhere it's not going to harm anyone no one's going to worry about it people get worried about nothing because it's you know you could stand under one of those in the middle of say i don't know i don't if you put one in, say say i put one in i don't know in somewhere like texas for example just to give you an example or maybe a, i don't know wyoming somewhere like that if you built one of them there you could stand under it. It's three kilometers across the recten rectenna. It's huge. It's wires buried underground usually. You could stand there. You, you would literally receive less energy personally on your head than what you get from your mobile phone. You, you're talking about huge amounts of energy, 10 yeah. gigawatts. The bigger you make it, the more you get. You know, it's literally like that. So it's a small size one for a three kilometer radius. Yeah. You can do it in different ways. You could use lasers, which is a different method. Now that that employs solar panels itself on the ground, and you beam the laser to those, and then you can. That's another way of doing it. That's slightly less reliable because it uses because it's using a laser. There's a bit of diffraction due to cloud cover. Now the U.S. Army and Navy are working on technology. Again, we didn't go into this in a big way, but they're looking at mobile systems that they would carry. Say you had a disaster in a, on an island somewhere, or maybe in in America. Say you had a I don't know. Say somewhere in Florida got flooded, or something happened where the electricity supplies got cut off. Rather than taking a huge generator that they have to carry an helicopter there, they could literally take just what looks like an unfillable blanket and unfurl that on the ground and then they could beam laser beams to that from space or from an airship they could with solar panels on the airship flying very high you could beam that down you'd have energy and you'd have loads of energy so those are other the methods and they're the laser ones are slightly less reliable but you know in the right way you're looking at um, that's a project that the u.s army are actually considering right at this moment i believe according to my sources anyway <laughs> which is mostly Paul Jaffe, I think. So, uh, <laughs> yeah. That's uh, fascinating. So what is, when we're talking about 10 gigawatts spread across like a nine square kilometer or more or less area. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and you say that the incidental exposure is not a concern. Yeah, is there not any, a concern at all. No. any way that this gets abused or refocused or redirected and weaponized because weaponized that's the okay everyone goes to the weaponized right. okay uh, right let me explain so what you've got to think about is how big how many solar panels you're going to put in space well in order to get that amount of energy you need a large area so you put those in space you've got three choices you can go for what they call low earth orbit which are going around and around rapidly you can go for medium Earth orbit, which is a bit slower, obviously. Or you can go for geo orbit, which is the one, the option that we think is probably the best for a number of reasons, simply because you can fix it over as a target and you can then give it a number of rectennas that it can point at. Using something called diffraction, it can literally switch one to the other. That's the other huge advantage of this technology on a side issue that you could literally have, say, uh, something in the Indian Ocean, uh, a rectenna in the Indian Ocean, you could be beaming to that. And then when that's no longer required, you can literally switch it to one off South Africa. And it's literally, you know, a switch. And it, and it doesn't move, the system doesn't move at all. It's just done under, you know, diffraction. It just interference. Mm -hmm. The wavelengths, you know, the, the waves will literally redirect the energy beam. Now, to weaponize it is an interesting one. There is a patent for a weaponized space-based solar system. In fact, there are two of them. You, you can look, re readily look them up. I think the first one was just like an idea to stick it in space and hope it would survive long enough to fire something at someone. But that won't work because, as we know, the Indians, but about five years ago, I think now, they've shot down a, um, a satellite. If they can shoot down a satellite, a space-based solar system sat up there that they know is a weapon is going to get knocked out very quickly. So there's no point, but it's just a big target that's just going to get annihilated in the, rapidly before anything even begins. 
So that's really not going to be a technology to worry about. One worrying version, though, is a what they call a rapid deployment version. So what you would do is you'd pack a smaller kind of space-based solar power system into a rocket, maybe more than one. You'd fire them up, deploy them rapidly, and then the moment they unfurl, you fire your lasers. That is a possibility. But again, it gives itself away somewhat because you've got to fire those rockets up. It's going to take time to unfurl. What's the enemy doing at that moment? They're thinking, oh, you're, you're just about to do something. Well, we've got other technology. We can knock that out. And looking at it from every angle I could, I could not find anyone in the military that would tell me that, you know, that was a that was a doable, mm-hmm. you know, thing. It's just pointless. So easily monitored, by the way, as well. Right. You know, people said, I've heard conspiracy theories online about Maui being zapped by some sort of space-based laser, if you remember that. Do you remember that one? Yeah. And this is just nonsense, you know. I mean, right. so again, it's doable, but it's not a very good weapon. It's actually a clumsy weapon. In fact, so clumsy that it makes it a bit like a, a sitting duck almost. You're just there for being picked off, really. So yeah. so what I'm hearing is that as, as long as there is sufficient oversight and yes, sufficient indeed. security, the incidental radiation you get from the beaming it down is not really a concern. Uh, that no that it's it's fine because we are pro nuclear it reminds me of the arguments for and against the safety and security of nuclear is because we in rely, a way it does indeed yeah, yes we, indeed we indeed. rely on I... oversight we rely on thorough knowledge and transparency yeah and background radiation is a thing and so the, the yes. worst accidents like three mile island yes, are very indeed. incidental and so i think if we yeah. We will be fighting many of the same opponents that have scared us about nuclear energy yeah. for decades. Yes. Yeah, well, we are. We we would definitely be fighting them. Yes. My only drawback with nuclear is simply I always worry about the nuclear proliferation side of it. But then again, we are now living in a new world. I mean, we've got a war going on in Ukraine. I think we're going to have to go down that road, sadly. And yeah. I think that if we can invent, if we can use thorium reactors if we can use some of the new fusion technology that's coming out which i really love um i think all of these are good possibilities as Mm -hmm. other methods of you know of making clean energy that's not going to release too much carbon dioxide although there are some issues on nuclear regarding the cooling down right now which i don't know if you've come across that but that can be um yeah that's a slight worry the thermal management of nuclear is a thing but when you actually compare the scale of it to the global induced CO2, it is yeah. it's minuscule. It yeah. is minuscule. That, the, reason, the, honest, yeah. the honest problem is we're talking about microbiomes. And so if you have a microbiome yeah. that is near yeah. a nuclear plant and you don't you don't contain yeah. all of that heat energy into a cooling tower and, yes. and turn it into water vapor, which has its own yes, of course. Its own problems. Yeah. It was many years ago, but I did speak with the person who studied sheep who lived under high voltage lines and studied the effects of radiation. And he, he wasn't, he was pretty sure that there was nothing there and there's almost, almost, yeah. almost guaranteed to be no impact. But what's going to be the, the give and take when we talk about microbiome impact of beaming energy down? Uh, there isn't going to be, hopefully. I mean, yeah. there might be people who will moan about everything and anything. It's the same, like you said, it's to do. The, it's the same idea with the nuclear thing. The, the The main benefit of the space-based solar power approach really is is to do with the costs. If you mm-hmm. think about global warming, I, I mean, I was looking up the Royal Geographic Society only the other day, actually. I think they had something like, I can't remember the exact figure, it's probably something like $46 trillion dollars per year was going to be the cost of we do nothing mm-hmm. we just sit around twiddle our thumbs and carry on burning you know fossil fuel like there's no tomorrow that'll be the cost so when you consider that the technology to put space-based solar power in is probably less than two and a half trillion uh, if that you know to put a decent system in that might be able to you know provide say i don't know 25 percent of the energy of you know major areas around major cities all over the world um, and then you can scale that up. Remember, we're talking about because I'm because the way I look on this is this is the beginning of what you said right at the beginning, the Dyson sphere. If we don't start somewhere, we we never give ourselves a chance. And I think we need to do that 
moves over to the other side of the aspect, which is really this resource problem that we're facing in general. And that's why we talked to Mitch Hunter Scullion about this, because he yeah. then says to us, yes, you know, this is rather interesting. Yeah. Go ahead, Gabe. Yeah, yeah. What I'd like to know is, is it possible that these solar panels in space could double as a way of shading the poles? Absolutely, yeah, because there are many ways to do this. We could put lots of modular um, systems in place, but we could put less panels and have reflectors instead, large ones. Now, suddenly we've shaded part of the Earth if we put them, if we make them big enough. But we'd need a lot of them. And then we could redirect some of that energy onto those panels. And then obviously that's that's a, another method. So there are mm. systems that have been developed. A very good uh, guy in Canada um, showed me a, a, another version of one where he actually would use reflectors to reflect onto solar panels that actually make energy in a different way. They actually use heat rather than uh, electricity. And then they can, he converts that to electricity to beam it back to Earth. So... It's a different method. Again, it's the same idea. The conversions, I think Elon Musk worries about the conversions, which actually isn't a problem in space because it's a 24-7 you know, nuclear power plant up there known as the sun. Um, you know, what you're worrying about, Elon, you know, get over it kind of thing. That's what I say to him. I think he should really worry about the co where he gets his cobalt from for his Tesla cars. That might be a, <laughs> yeah. just like a worry, you know, the, the slave miners of the Congo, for example. I think, yes, it could double up as a shade on over the poles. And that's indeed a technology that would be one of the technologies that might come out of this, not only as a shade, but also as a reflecting system so that we can actually scale down the amount of solar panels we have to put in space. Interesting. Yeah, the different advantages and the capacity factor difference itself is that is the big thing. And people whine about the efficiency of nuclear's inefficient but you you look at the efficiency of having 24 7 energy and it is enormous compared to yeah. conventional solar you go from a 15 percent capacity factor yeah. maybe more a little bit more if you're lucky and it goes yeah. to 100 percent capacity factor yeah and close to it it's worth losing 20 to 40 percent if you have a yeah, conversion absolutely it doesn't matter it's it's it what paul jaffe will actually says in the film is this his concern is not the efficiency of the system his only concern is what is the cost of getting one kilogram of that into space mm -hmm. that's his problem that's so obviously we looked at that as well so we looked at the, how many rockets would it take you know and all this kind of stuff Again, it, it works out because remember what I said at the beginning, the 46 trillion cost of doing nothing compared with the two and a half trillion of doing something. So yeah. it's not a problem. You know, the, when you look at trillions, you're not worried about rocket costs to yeah. get stuff what, in space. What I'm excited about is uh, when you talk about the, the cost to launch, uh, the yeah. alternative is a very, very important factor that you've identified, which is orbital extraction and manufacturing yeah and when i'm talking about bootstrapping that's really what i'm interested in is what is yeah. going to be the the obstacles to building that asteroid belt manufacturing capability yeah. yes that's a very interesting one so we looked at that briefly i think that is early stages kind of thing so currently most of the most of the guys talking about this We'll talk about getting panels into space that unfurl. They're light. They're very lightweight. Either that or reflectors that will, that will also un unfurl on a much bigger scale and then use those panels as a means to obviously they'll, they'll reflect sunlight onto those. So they don't, they don't often talk about manufacturing in space. However, there is a Japanese company that wants to build a manufacturing system on the moon. I was going to ask that you about that. That is a totally yep. new... Now, that's not a new idea, but... That goes back a bit. Also, we could use the point where you are in space where everything's balanced and you could set your manufacturing up there. And there's even a company in Portland, Oregon, who we missed out on interviewing, but we might do it another day. We might go back again, right, make a second or a third film about this subject because it's so interesting. One of the ideas that he had is he's developing technology that actually prints components and he said to me that he could actually print components in space. So 
So he says, all we need is the material to go up there. So you'd send it up in there in a canister. It'd be locked into a small, you know, like manufacturing, robotic manufacturing system. Again, no, all of this technology never uses any humans, by the way. It's all done by robots. So that's the other thing. The other advantage of developing this is AI and AI robots, which will run this for us. So there's add-on things that are going on here behind the scenes that people don't want to talk about. But so once, you, once you've got that into space, then you can start printing these systems actually in space, which is mind-blowing, really. And of course, then that's when we started to think about resources, because obviously, where are we going to get all the resources to do this? Is there a better way? Is there another source? And that's where the moon comes in, obviously. And so, you know, on onwards to, to kind of look at that in a, in a broader way. That's all right. It's very encouraging. The, the, the big thing and the big argument, I guess I might have is we can do nuclear in space. And in fact, it's more weight efficient after Mars, but inside, yeah. inside Mar Mars's orbit, you will definitely have an advantage when it comes to mission weight versus energy output. Uh, and yeah. even as, you know, as this develops mission weight, will become less important. So the the, yes. bat, the better, the faster this orbital yeah. and off-Earth manufacturing becomes yeah. established, it almost won't matter. And then the radius of of solar energy collection will expand. And and we yeah, just yeah, we indeed. save the nuclear because we we, yeah. we will have limited, you know, even though it will be enormous amounts, billions of years of uranium on Earth yeah. and probably yeah, ocean, hundreds yeah. of billions in the solar system, but it's still limited. And so we will want to eventually expand that radius of solar collection as far as, as yes. is feasible. Uh, but yes. still, you know, I, I, I see like, you know, nuclear thermal propulsion helping bootstrap this. And it seems you of know, course very, it will. Yes. very exciting to, to get it off the um get it off the planet and get it moving faster it, it seems like a the perfect ally to this system yeah it is we haven't we haven't discussed that at all because we we decided that we had to keep our film to a certain length right the trouble yeah. the, the trouble of the yeah. film like this is originally this was film this film was developed to be a pilot really for a much broader series mm -hmm. and so if we could We'll, we'll talk, we've got some connections in Netflix. We've got a few people in Channel 4 in the UK, which is a, another channel that operates here. That you, it's not your Channel 4, but our Channel 4, if you understand. Right. Um, so we've got a few connections that which we're looking at to talk to them about making it into a series and actually talking about all these technologies, including nuclear, mm. including nuclear in space, including, including everything, really, that goes along wow. with this. Because That's exciting. My, my own personal belief is that we've got two choices. We can sit here and literally uh decline as a species with with all the things that we're doing or we can use our minds and think in a new way to actually get ourselves off planet earth in in a, in a way that conserves our own resources and then allows us to do greater things with the resources that we can harvest and that's when i spoke to mitch hunter scullion because he's the asteroid mining company guy who's absolutely fascinating um, and I could be here all day talking about him, but but you can ask me a question about that in a minute, I suppose. Yeah. I'd like to hear about the asteroid mining part. The asteroid that. mining, you'd like to know. Yeah. Okay, I'll, Before I'll we tell go you about that. Yeah. 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 Okay, and then we'll talk about yeah. that. Okay, so Mitch Hunter Scullion, actually, we met him at his office in Canary Wharf, um, which is a, a very plush looking place. Um, he's a he's a real character. I mean, if you met him, you're in another world completely. And so Valerie and Jude Allen, who's the director of the film, um, went out there and, and you know chatted to him, and he took her, took them up to the office, and and then he pulls out all these materials out of this little box. He had a, he had a load of different things. Some of these uh, materials contain platinum, and just to kind of put you in the picture, his initial plan is to go and harvest platinum from a passing asteroid, which he says should be doable in, in the next 10 years. Wow. Okay. And he's going to use rockets to get there, no doubt. But he does understand and he, and he immediately appreciated our point, which was 
how do you get your probes out into the asteroid field quickly and efficiently? And he immediately, obviously, saw space-based solar power as a means to move those probes out there. And this is obviously Professor Lubin's point as well, that if we want to go quick, we want to, we don't want to take, you know, like years to get to somewhere, we want to get there in weeks or months, then we need to use this technology instead. So that's a little bit of a flavour of it. Um, so initially, it's looking at things like rare earth elements. And obviously, if you think about our world currently, we're burning up copper like there's no tomorrow. If you think about, you know, think about an electric car, for example. I think mm. it's something like my father was a chemist. He used to tell me that 15 kilograms of copper is equivalent to one ton of rocks with acid added to it as an extra. So if you think of a little car like a Fiat, if you think of a little Italian car, you know, those tiny little ones that you see driving around sometimes that people have, that's 15 kilograms of copper wire in that normal combustion engine car. And that's and, and, and then you imagine that's actually one ton of rocks behind it. If you can imagine that's what you, that's your kind of ecological footprint, if you want to put it in terms of rocks rather than carbon or something. So, Obviously, out in space, everything is out there, things out there. We're not harvesting vast amounts of rainforest to get at this copper or we're not slave mining. And obviously, then the question was, well, what what do we do with the people that these industries, you know, what what do platinum miners do if they haven't can't harvest platinum? But of course, the thing is, you can always there's an economic way of reinvesting so that you change the dynamic of that. It doesn't become a problem. So that these are the kinds of subjects that Mitch and 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 Valerie Danko, who's the interviewer, discussed at the time, which was a most fascinating, uh, you know, interview of probably of all of them in in many ways. So yeah, so the resources are out there. We need to go and get them. I think there's no question that one day we will do it. Um, I think was it was it. I can't remember if it was Dyson himself who said that one day we'll probably take the planet Mercury apart and turn it into a Dyson sphere or a Dyson ring, something like that. But, you know, it's kind of that level, isn't it, really, if you think about it. It's, it is out there. This this has to be worked on. Space-based solar and asteroid mining are, a, are something that one day will come together. It's just going to take time, you know, yeah. to do that. But they will happen. Whether they happen, you know, in the next 30, 40 years, I don't know. Maybe it's 100 years away. Who knows? Mm -hmm. But it's going to happen, I'm almost certain. The abundance of copper in the solar system is about half the abundance of cobalt. So if you hear that, Elon, you know, we're live on X with about 20 people watching. Yeah. We can get cobalt with orbital mining. Yeah, we can With indeed, robots yeah. and AI. It's easy. Yeah. <laughs> it's out there. It's doable. It's doable if we if we put ourselves out and, and go for it, you know, in terms all, all the technologists I've talked to, including AI guys, you know, also some of I know a few from Italy, They've all told me this is doable. This is definitely doable. There's no question that we have the, in fact, we're very close to it right now of making robots that can go and mine. I know yeah. from Mitch Hunter Scullion that he's working on it right now and they're working on deep sea robots because they want to test their robots out under the water firstly before they venture into space, which makes perfect yeah. sense if you think about it. It's the same yeah. kind of, you know, a hostile environment in, in a different way. So yeah. these, this is all doable. You just need to yeah. really get there, really, I think. It takes decades to bring a mining operation on Earth from yeah. zero to actual Yeah, it won't, it won't happen overnight, but it will happen. Yeah. Um, he's, he's, he, he says to me, they're working on it, you know, as we're talking, they've got connections with everyone. Or, I mean, they're, they're not just a British company, they're a Japanese company as well, you know, they're both. So they've already gone international. I've almost put my bottom dollar on it. He'll be, he'll be talking to American uh, people as well no doubt and canadians and there'll be other countries getting involved amazing i think this is a great place to end that's a very inspiring thank you our our guest john clarkson the filmmaker mm -hmm. behind stargazer a film about orbital solar and mining this has been the eco modernist channel live you can find us every sunday at 10 a.m pacific 1 p.m eastern here on the Eco Modernist channel live. And don't forget, you can donate to us on Patreon at the Eco Modernist Society. And remember, emissions first, peace and justice will follow.
please subscribe to us on YouTube. You can watch channel. Also to subscribe to us on Twitter and Facebook, Ecomodern Society of North America. And online at https.esna.earth.